Welcome to the Audio Socket Podcast. We're currently exploring the impacts of AI on the music industry and how artists and creators will thrive in an AI era. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today, we are going to be looking at the role of law and its impact to shaping things for IP owners in an AI era. I have John Zeger on with me today. He has an incredible background, so hyper-relevant across the intersection of creative, um, music, AI technology. I'm going to let him give a deep dive on his background, but just some highlights. He built legal and policy over at Stripe, which I'm sure is a common household name for most. Uh, before that, he was associate general counsel at Microsoft, and he is the co-founder of a new company called Responsible Innovation Labs. And so I think that'll be really exciting to talk about and just understanding how with AI having a new story pretty much every single day, how that's impacted the work that he's doing and for him to explain to us what is responsible innovation. So let me turn it over to you, John, welcome. And if you could just share with us, um, you know, a, a more detailed version of your role yeah. and how it intersects. Yeah, happy to do it, Jen. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so, we, I mean, as you said, I, I have been uh, a lawyer in the technology industry for a long time for uh, a bunch of different uh, companies dealing with um, a wide variety of uh, technology, and law and policy issues uh, at Microsoft. I'll just hit that for a second because it was, as it turns out, very relevant to a lot of these questions. I was uh, the lawyer for Microsoft search engine for, for many years at a time when a lot of the norms around how uh, copyrighted material, uh, images, video, uh, to some degree, trademarks as well uh, were being used, and there was there was a lot of law being developed. There's quite a bit of litigation. Google was at the forefront of a lot of that, but we were also quite involved. Um, so many of these issues were uh, were ones that I had tackled and or spent real time on uh, during that period. I was then at Stripe for a number of years, a real kind of startup experience, starting at a tiny baby company and and being part of growing it to a to a great big uh, kind of global behemoth. Uh, and then when I left in 2020, you know, one of my reflections on all of those experiences was innovation driven by ambitious technology companies is perhaps the most powerful force shaping the world. In many ways, it's more powerful than the, the you know, strictly the actions that governments take. It's, um, you know, maybe climate change it would be kind of a, in, a, in a similar category, but, a, but in a different way. Um, and yet, as powerful as it is, as impactful as it is for all of us, um, we really have devoted very little uh, sort of time and serious thought to how we use that power well. And in particular, how we help early stage companies um, think about their impacts on society and kind of build um, that into their culture, build it into their incentive structure, uh, and get um, you know values alignment with their investors and other kind of key constituents. So we started Responsible Innovation Labs with that as our kind of goal. How do we how do we uh, devote more resources? How do we devote more thinking to that kind of creation moment for companies? And thinking about their long-term uh, impact on society, it's a it's an independent uh, nonprofit organization. We have many of the largest venture capital firms uh, as our members, uh, and we both organize them in community and around specific kinds of standards that we're creating, including uh, one that we've been working on for some time on on responsible AI. So I can talk a little bit more about it in the context of our conversation, but it is you know the, these topics are very much uh, in in our in our minds these days. Yeah, I, uh, you know, having started my own company, I can definitely say that while I think everybody has a moral compass, um, I think the work you guys are doing is is very innovative because nobody was really talking to me about what are the implications. And we've certainly run into that uh, across some deals that we've done. Um, and I think it's it's really great to be thinking about it proactively as opposed to responsively. Um you know, as I mentioned um, in an earlier conversation, I think that often technologies, especially for creatives, are born out of lawsuits and typically are mm -hmm. delivered by the party that 
has been sued. So Mm -hmm. not necessarily um, the best outcome. But I think as well, part of the onus is on creatives and IP owners to unify. And, you know, part of the series objective is really to figure out how we come to the table and how we start to help really shape the solutions while they're being created. So, yeah, um, yeah. I I would love to know what you see as the critical role of law in in charting the path forward. It's a, it's a really interesting question and one that I think is, um, you know, at the moment, certainly uh, there's a real question mark that hangs over it and, and I think will for some period of time. My sense it, it, right now uh, is that law will not be the principal determiner uh, of of how the relationship between AI technology and creatives shapes up. Um, I think it will be a material uh, part of that. It's certainly going to be an important part of it, but I don't think given the pace at which uh, law moves either either new legislation or or kind of definitive litigation um, that that's likely to be determinative uh, in the near term. I think the the decisions that are made by technology companies, the decisions that are made by creators, and you know the kind of culture that we build around it, and what consumers and other and other uh, you know. Uh, parties come to demand. I think those things are likely to be somewhat more determinative in the in the near to medium term. Now that being said, I you know if you look at um, you know almost all significant changes in um, kind of technology practice, they do result in having some real kind of risk on sitting on the other side right why do why do i why do i implement uh privacy controls because i because i care about privacy well i might care about privacy right but i really do it because i don't want the ftc to sue me um or, or you know or i don't or i don't want a state attorney general to to sue and uh or increasingly now because i don't want the, to the significant risk of the you know the gdpr the european uh data protection statute and and the fines that would be associated with that and so i do think you you know the 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 risk uh in a in dealing with these issues of ai and and ip and creators rights outside of law is where does the forcing function come from, right? Why, why, why do I, re- if I'm a technology company, why do I kind of unilaterally disarm and give something to creators um, that they haven't actually, you know, that, that, that forced me to give? And I, I think, you know, that that will be an interesting question. And it's and it's the place where law has played over time. I think the most definitive role you get ultimately, you get a judgment, you get a fine, you get something like that. I think we're so far away from that that it's not going to be a, a shaping force for now. But ultimately, I think it's it's an important part of it. And with things changing on a daily basis, I mean, how does this impact the work that you're doing? Um, you know, working with companies, trying to help them be ethical, be responsible. Uh, it seems like yeah. you know, rug gets pulled out from underneath you every day. It's it's so it's so crazy. Um, you know, this is a topic where I think if you literally if you spent you know uh, all of your waking hours sort of reading about new developments in in AI technology policy, uh, you know, and so forth, uh, I don't think you could con- you know a normal person could consume uh, even a meaningful fraction of it. It's just just an awful lot. So it, so it that is I think uh, a real issue. The thing that we're very focused on uh, at Responsible Innovation Labs, and the thing that gives me some hope in the near term is, well, I mean, a few things, and let me kind of string together a little bit of a a daisy chain. I think um, it's clear that whether it's government or industry, um, even consumers uh, with things like ChatGPT, um, there's a huge demand for these technologies. And I think there is a demand both in some cases because of the novelty, but in in, in many cases because it, it lets people do a job that simply wasn't really possible to be done at least at, at the sort of zero marginal costs that it is that it is being done today, right? Like it, 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 I'll, I'll give you the, I'll give you the simplest example of this, which is, I, I, I had I had a, a guy doing a little bit of work for me on a property that we owned. The young guy, brand new, brand new in his business, 
and he knew I was a lawyer and, uh, and he, he, he presented me with this contract that he, uh, you know, for, for the work. Uh, and I, and I read the contract and I was, I, I thought to myself when I read it, Hey, this is pretty good. It's actually a pretty good contract. It's really clearly written. It's pretty short, but it seems to cover all the main things. It's actually pretty good. Um, as a contract, you know, lawyer, I, I, I felt I feel like I had a, a reasonable place to evaluate it. And he and he says to me when I see him afterwards, he says, "Hey, J- what do you think of my contract?" Yeah, have you heard of this thing called ChatGPT? <laughs> um, and I was like, "Yeah," and and so, but 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 I use it as an example because it's 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 a it's a job that. Um, it would not the kind of marginal cost, uh, you know, is uh, of using ChatGPT is tilt, you know, sort of tilt to zero. It's appro- approaching nothing, and so that's a piece of work that gets done, and you do get a contract there. Whereas in the past, probably that individual either, either writes something on a napkin or he, does, you know, he decides not to do anything, right? And I think you have that 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 the demand signal right now from the market at all levels is we want much more of that. So everybody wants to buy these services in, right? And there's tons of dollars being invested in them. Okay, that's that's sort of thing one in the in the in the daisy chain. Lots of lots of market demand. Thing thing two is a, a lot of those buyers um have existing commitments. They have um they have privacy commitments they've made. They have uh, they have a variety of ethical commitments they've made. They have ESG commitments they've made. They've had they have various things. They just have a, a kind of uh, you know general brand commitments that they have made. And they look at these technologies that they want to buy in. They want to help automate things. They want to get this additional. Um, and they say we don't know what's in that black box, right? We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna start consuming that thing. We don't quite we don't trust it. And so what's happening in the market is. As as those buyers go to the providers of this technology, they're demanding a bunch of assurances. Tell us that you have all the rights that you need. Tell us that you don't violate privacy. Tell us these all of these things. Well, there are no standards there. To to what you know what what do these things mean in this context? And so what you've ended up with is a lot of inefficiency, a lot of kind of dueling forms, you know, tell me this in my due diligence, you know, I'm going to do some due diligence, tell me, assure me of this. Well, I can't really assure you of that and and so on. So there's a kind of market inefficiency that's developed there um, and is going to get a lot worse as as more of these products begin to come to market and as more as that demand continues to increase. There just is, is no or no clear standards. So what we're finding is um, that there actually is interest on both the buyer, the 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 seller, you know, sort of the the creators of this technology, and the investor side, because they want to see these markets flourish, um, in standards being developed, um, they want to see standards because they want to reduce this market uh, inefficiency. They want to know what what does it take to do this well. What does it take to meet your expectations? And that's where that's the place where we're starting to play. I think that's where you see some of the. Uh, kind of uh, regulatory work that's beginning to happen also sort of in this kind of standardization, standardization of something like red teaming, those those kinds of things. And that gives me some hope um, that we will get, uh, you know, the, the market will drive some some greater clarity here. I, I was in a conversation um, recently with a friend over a pint talking about AI and industry standards. And I was thinking, it, it would be really interesting to have something like, um, you know, when you watch a movie and it's rated PG or it's rated G or rated R, um, I feel like that kind of system for an approach to AI would be really interesting. Is that anything that's surfaced in terms of like a rating system for risk? It has indeed. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, quite a bit of discussion of of developing a system like that. I think we will, we will do... Um, not precisely that thing, but a kind of certification system that has a sort of tiering associated with it. That's one of the projects that we're working on. But there are a number of other groups that are that are doing um, are thinking about similar things. I think it's very likely that you will have um, some ability to, to look at a sort of score or or you know sort of certification of, of an AI and kind of make some decisions on that basis. I, I think that's true. The interesting question there is sort of what are the relevant vectors? What do you care about as a consumer? And that's I think one of the things that makes this um, you know quite 
quite challenging. A lot of the energy of, on, around regulating AI has gone into, you know, things like safety, w- which are super important. I, I, I not not say I think those are pretty appropriate things to be focused on, but they are not necessarily things that, as a consumer, you would care quite as much about. So, safety in that case usually means things like. You know, can I use it to, I don't know, you know, figure out the formula for anthrax or, you know, these kinds of things, right? Which is like, well, you know, sure, you, you probably not your, it's not, not your driving motivation to make sure that the, that the tool doesn't, doesn't do that. So what do you care? What do consumers care about? What, are, what do, you know, in this, for this audience, what do creators care about? You know, is it something like, um, you know, adequate labeling of what is real content versus what is what is automatically generated content is it you know is it uh respect for uh, uh creators rights is it is it privacy is it other things like that figuring out what's the salient set of information to really convey uh is going to be an interesting question but definitely lots of people thinking about it what are you seeing as some of the more innovative concepts around uh i guess licensing models, sustainable revenues for IP owners. Yeah, it's I mean it's interesting I, I, to be to be honest with you at the moment uh there's nothing that I see that is super that I think is super likely to be successful. Um you have for example, you know, you probably seen uh the stuff that Adobe's been working on here right um where um, they are essentially using licensed content uh, to provide various features where there there's their AI features in their products and the and the underlying content they sort of guarantee is uh, you know is uh, is licensed is uh, is appropriately licensed. Um, I, I've heard some uh, you know I think reasonable uh, complaints from creators about that that they that, that those those rights were not necessarily um, you know. Uh, license in the con- in that context and is a sense that it's a little 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 bait and switchy and um n- nevertheless i think it's an important the, the, the reason i think that one's important is one because of the scale obviously adobe has has huge scale uh among you know the the the, the tooling for for creators in particular um but it's also i think probably a really important market signal if if we begin to see that people really want there is a demand for people knowing having a kind of certainty about um the kind of ip provenance and the and and the appropriate licensing of the stuff that they're using i think that will be quite important you know one of the things that you had happen in the you know, early 2000s as as a lot of the fair use copyright law got established around things like search. You remember the book search case and all of that interesting, uh, you know, stuff that Google did where they were scanning library books and the Authors Guild sued them and, and all of these things. Lots of lo- lots of interesting law was made there, but it was very the law was very impacted by the fact um, that the market had kind of come to expect a certain set of things, right? It's it, c- courts are not primarily political actors, but they they exist in a political reality. And so, when when the facts on the ground get established, when you create consumer behavior, when you create really scaled behavior, where people say, "Actually, we don't care about copyright. We just expect to get the data, right? We just expect it to work this way for us and be this sort of free resource." Um, it becomes a little hard for courts to really push back hard and reset to a, to a very different place. And so I think when you have things like this Adobe experiment and you got Microsoft is doing this thing now where it's sort of indemnifying uh, against copyright claims for, for, for AI as a way to kind of signal that it's, it's going to, it's going to kind of take care of that risk for its users. When you get these sort of things, I think it's actually quite helpful because it, it, it creates a, a sort of baseline in the market that um is you know not everything is going to be free and available right like there 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 is going to be a meaningful market segment um where people expect to know where they're where this creation came from they expect to pay the creators of it and um and i and i think um 
anyway, you know, I, I think that's uh, I think that really may, will make a difference to how the law ultimately gets established. That there are there is real evidence that people do in fact pay creators. That it's not necessarily just you know uh, open season on on all things uh, copyright. And where do you think human creativity um, proliferates? In, in an AI era, I mean, where is mm-hmm. where is uh, efficiency going to you know surpass the desire for human creativity, and where is human creativity going to always prevail? Oh wow, <laughs> that's a good that's a good question. I want to be interested in your in your perspective on, but um... well, what do you see? I mean, I guess position another way, artists are fearful that you know this is going to take their jobs and yeah. and it will ai will get so good that it will become really good at recreating their art so yeah. where is the space that we protect that we build and that we ensure the creatives can proliferate um you know so that we we don't run the risk of of really um losing all of all of what is there on an artistic scale i yeah this this is this is a question that is um Kind of near and dear to my heart. My one of my my uh, daughters is a uh, is in design school right now, and and uh, and so I you know and, and this is a question we we talk about. Um, I guess there's a couple of ways to think about this. Um, you know, one I, is is a sort of cultural question that I I certainly don't know the answer to, and I think it's one that we will have to develop norms around. But is to what degree do we value a, th- a creation because it is the product of a human being? Um, so, uh, you know, I I think um, there is uh, a quality. You know, that people people was you know often say you know uh, patronize living artists, right? Buy buy from living artists because because art is itself important, not just for the piece, but it's an important. Uh, it serves an important function in our society and artists serve an important function in our society and therefore we should value them and therefore we should pay them. You know, I think you can uh, l- look at, look at society as it exists today and say that, you know, the story there is kind of mixed, right? Sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. And and obviously I, I don't think we, uh, in many cases, I don't think we adequately compensate artists for their work. Nevertheless, I think there is already some sense that, uh, the things that come from art, from artists bec- are, are a product of their humanity and therefore value valuable to us for for that purpose, almost independent from the from the creation itself. Um, so that's one thing. Just this cultural: to what degree are we going to value the, the the humanness of them? The second, and this is you know, I, I think an interesting um, phenomenon, especially for people who are newer in their careers as creators, is. How do we get to the place where um, AI is uh, an accelerant to creation mm-hmm. uh, and not viewed as a competitor to creation? And so, you know, um, if you go, if you look at, um, you know, this is probably not a great comparison. Well, there are lots of folks who know more about this period who will who will probably correct correct my my inaccurate historical knowledge. But if you look at sort of the the the, the Renaissance uh, uh, painters, right? Uh, you, you know, a Da Vinci, uh, uh, whatever. Um, all of these folks had workshops, right? They they were the the if you if you go to a museum and look at one of those pieces of work, it's it's often the case. Um, that some or all or a very substantial part of the work was not created by the named artists. It was the workshop of that artist, right? There, there, was, there, was, a, there was a, there was a, in other words, there was a kind of a creative machine um, there that were a bunch of skilling up professionals in that case. So still human beings and still, uh, you know, very different in that sense, in the sense that they were building toward their own independent creative endeavors. Um, so, so I, I don't want to draw the analogy too closely. But what it did do is create a world in which the artist who conceived of the work, who uh, uh, corrected and directed the work, in some cases did meaningful parts of the work, um, was able to be immensely productive. And so you have, tr- you know, the tremendously prolific 
uh, uh, artists with a real vision and a real style, even though they did not paint every brush stroke or, or make every chip out of the, out of the marble. And I think, I think for creators now embracing AI in that way, um, as how do I, how do I let this take my vision? Uh, but, but, you know, get where I could only come up with three options for a concept. I can get AI to help me come up with 50 versions of the concept, right? I can, I can hone in, I can really dial in particular things. I can get a lot of examples of how this might be different. Um, and, and then I can execute in a way that really lets me nail the vision that I, I think that's the, um, you know, that's the best case scenario. Does it work completely? I, I, I think, you, you know, not necessarily. I, I'll, I'll, you know, we were, before we were talking a little bit about this conversation I'd had with a, with a film producer who was thinking about AI and, um, and how they would use it in their writing process. And indeed, you know, this is a very successful producer who want to recently produce a big Academy Award winning um, film and um you know for them what they're what they expect to to use it for is to generate way more ideas mm-hmm. um and so what what the way he he talked about that was um the for kind of b and c grade writers the people who would be generating lots of ideas for us in the past they're kind of in trouble um, they are going to, they're going to struggle, uh, because there'll be less of that for a grade writers. They're going to do much better. Yeah. Um, and I, th- I think that's kind of how I, I anticipate things are going to end up shaping up. That's, that's very consistent across, um, interviews we've done with creators as well. I mean, I think the creators that are really, uh, leading the charge in AI, they're embracing it, they're finding the ways to use it to their advantage to optimize efficiencies, um, further create. Uh, but I think, you know, the the concept is probably more of the the people that are doing underscore and, you know, kind of background music, sort of, sort of like what you're talking with about with the writers. I think that mm-hmm. those jobs are, you know, are, are probably in trouble, but with jobs that go away, new jobs are created as, as we see with all cycles. It reminds me a little bit of, um, as you were talking about it, somewhat of a cultural, uh, phenomenon too, is really when you look at mom and pop shops and Mm -hmm. I live in London. Um, we travel to Europe a lot. And if I go to Switzerland, for example, it's all mom and pop shops. I mean, they really value, The idea that you can go in and you can talk to a human and you're going to get really expert information. Um, And it may become that, you know, it may be that there's a really a real cultural uh, sort of divide there in terms of how we embrace it, whether, you know, whether we embrace it, uh, you know, at what level, I guess. Yeah. Um, So curious and and um, I don't know that we can answer this yet, but when you think about AI and, you know, the other sorts of disruptions that you've seen, do you feel like AI is different? Is it more disruptive? Is it, call it, um, fundamentally game-changing in a way that you've not seen before? Or do you see it as sort of any other kind of technical technological advancement? Yeah, I, I, I do. I, I tend to be fairly anti kind of hype in general, but I, but I do really believe that AI is... Um, not an incremental technology. I think it's, I think it's a fundamental technology. Uh, and I think it will be, you know, it's hard, it obviously it's hard to compare and, and maybe not even that useful, but I, you know, as I think about the technology cycles across my, you know, uh, 25 plus years of, of being in this business, um, it's probably closest to, uh, the iPhone, um, in terms of, a. Uh, um a really pervasive i think i think initially you look at a technology and you kind of see it's um it's kind of apparent use right okay i have this i have this thing and it has a few apps and now i have a oh now i also have a pretty good camera on my phone and i have a you know calculator and a few other things um and what you what you don't necessarily realize is uh, and it takes some time to realize is that 
the platform creates all of these opportunities for fundamentally different experiences. Um, and, and then that begins to open up all kinds of other things. So now, you know, in 2000, in 2006, you walked out of your house and you could get lost um, unless you had a, you know, a clunky separate GPS machine or whatever, you know, like, and now in, in 2023, you can't, you know, you go over out of your house in London or in Seattle or wherever. And it, as long as you have your phone with you, you can't get lost because you have, you have this thing. Right. And that, in, in that, in you know, in you know, a million different versions of of that example, right? So it's a, it's a it's chocolate and peanut butter together. It's like they existed, but now all of a sudden you you're like, holy cow, this opens up, you know, this this new this new thing. And I think that's the that's the thing with AI that I think is is going to be most interesting, right? We we see Chat GPT, we see these um, kind of call and response creator resources, right? I go and I, I ask it and it gives me, and I ask it and it gives me creative, give me a picture that looks like this, whatever. Um, I think what we're going to see is maybe a little bit less on the pure sort of generative AI side and more on kind of the, 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 the more general AI side is um, when you have the ability to have human level, let's I'm not, I'm not when I'm talking about AGI here, uh, artificial general intelligence, but just just kind of where it is today, sort of comparable to a um, uh, you know a reasonably bright you know uh, college sophomore, <laughs> you know that that sort of you know le- level of um, if when you have that technology that can turn on almost any problem more or less infinitely, right? You can, you can look at every, every molecule that's been generated and decide whether that's a compound that could be used for, um, you know, that's worth studying for a particular drug application. You can look uh, all these, that, that, um, uh, bringing kind of thinking down to close to zero marginal cost, um, is going to create a lot of incredible opportunities for people. Every kid can have a teacher, that is infinitely patient, knows exactly how to talk to them and has access to all the world's information. And that teacher might not be a supplement, you, you might, might not supplant their teacher, might supplement their human teacher. You, you know, same for nurses, same for doctors, same for lawyers, same for so on. That's going to just be so game-changing um, that I think it's 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 sort of hard to wrap your head around what does a world of thinking abundance look like because because right now there's there's thinking scarcity thinking and creation scarcity across almost every part of society and there will be thinking and creation abundance across almost every part of society and that's going to be really fundamentally uh, different than anything we've seen before yeah well and time scarcity as well (laughs) yeah i mean time is irrelevant as it relates to ai so right right um so to end on a juicy subject yesterday uh the Biden administration um, put out their executive order. And Mm -hmm. today um, the AI summit kicked off here in the UK uh, Mm -hmm. with global leaders around the world meeting to talk about AI. What, you know, anything surprising to you, anything encouraging to you? uh, What's your response? I I mean, the, the administration executive order has a lot of good stuff. It is similar to signals that they have sent before in terms of their focus on uh, safety, security, and privacy. You know, so those are kind of thematically throughout the document. Obviously, you know, the administration does a thing like this uh, in the absence of legislation on it, right? So there's a kind of perception of a need. In the best case, you probably actually create a law that is bespoke uh, for it. We, for various reasons in the U.S., uh, haven't done that. Uh, I think it's unlikely that we will for some time to come. And so what ends up happening is the, is the administration uses the powers that it has under existing laws uh, and under existing you know, kind of executive authority um, to try to do some things. And so as a result of that, it's kind of a grab bag. It's sort of, you know, the uh, the FCC will look at this, and the and the and the Commerce Department will look at that, and 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 so it's a, it's it's a it's a lot of different um, government actions 
um, that um, ladder up, to, I think, to a real to an expression of what the, what the administration wants to see happen in the market, but without you know without a sort of overarching kind of you know specificity and clarity that you would have if you had a if you had a you had a new law. Anyway, that that being said, I think on the positive side, um, I think the government sending signals that it wants to uh, one that it, in its role as kind of buyer um, that it's going to start to expect some certain things out of out of AI technology super important the the government as kind of market maker uh, and and a de facto standard creator just in its role as consumer is is a super important thing so I think that's that's a really positive thing and aligns with some of the work that that we in groups like us are doing to try to create some industry standards um I think the stuff that they're doing around foundation models um, and establishing uh, best practices on on red teaming and sort of safety standards and and disclosure obligations for those things is good. It is not as good as if um, if those were actually enforceable, um, which they are they are currently uh, not because they don't really have the the legislative authority to do that. But um, but it's good and it's important and it's a good step forward. Um, th- there's lots of other things to like. I think what you would have to say right now is mostly it's a bit of a wait and see. It's a it's a good first start, and we will have to see what comes out of these agencies over the next, you know, three to nine months as uh, as a bunch of these processes that have been kicked off uh, by this uh, this order um, actually come to fruition, and we see we see what comes out of that. But overall, I think a, I think a good thing. Um, and 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 quite and maybe the last thing I'll say on that is quite quite different if you compare it to any earlier technology wave where we have very much been in the mode of let it happen, see what problems develop, and then try to do some you know try to close the the door after the the horse is out of the barn. Um, it, we're we're really you know the government has said we're going to try something different this time. We're going to try to get in front of it. Whether it works or not, I think we'll all learn a bunch. But it, but it is, it is a fundamentally new thing in that sense. Um, the AI, uh, uh, the summit over in the UK, I think is super important. Um, it's uh, frankly, you know, from my perspective, it's nice that China is there as well. Um, I, I do think you have to really get people into um, a global conversation, and, and the EU, obviously, or the UK, I should say, is, is really trying to be um, the the leader and distinguish itself. Um, as the as the the folks who are pro innovation and and yet really thinking seriously about this set of issues, so it's great it's great to see that the rest of the world is um, participating. Um, I don't think anything substantive is going to come out of it. Um, you know, deep, deeply substantive. I don't I don't think there will be a draft of a of a you know uh, a law or or uh, those kinds of things. But it's an important conversation. I, my sense um, from having talked to people in and around this is um, the most likely place that you're going to see some global kind of compact will be on these frontier models, um, things that can really um, can really develop, you know, potentially the most kind of dangerous, you know, again, this is the formula for anthrax or a new, a new biological agent or, or, you know, these kinds of things. I think that's where there probably will be some common um, norms or standards that may even get at some point get uh, reflected in law beyond that in terms of the kind of day-to-day use of AI. I suspect that there's very little that happens at a global level and you end up having that dealt with mostly, uh, mostly nationally. Um, with some countries like, or some regions like the EU, you know, having very ambitious legislation that ends up becoming a kind of de facto standard for other countries, which I think is where we might end up with the with the uh, the EU's AI Act. But um, but still, I mean, I think the conversations are important, so it's good to see it happening. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, I know you're a busy person. Uh, are you able to tell us some of the companies that you're working with at Responsible Innovation Labs? I mean, we we have worked with uh, in in terms of our work on AI. We've worked with uh, you know really all of the kind of leading or many of the leading companies. I want to say all of the leading companies on this. Um, so OpenAI, Anthropic, uh, Meta, uh, uh, DeepMind. Um, 
you know, a variety of others as well, as, as well as a bunch of, honestly, for me, a lot of what is most interesting in this space is less those big uh, companies that, that we've all heard of who are, who are, I think in many cases, taking these risks seriously and really trying to do good work. Not, in, not in every case, but I, I, I think in general, really trying to do the right thing. Um, but a lot of, a lot of the most interesting stuff is actually the startups. Um, there are startups building, uh, we work with a number of folks in the healthcare space. Some of them, some of them are still in stealth mode, so I'm not going to go through names, but, um, working on really interesting developments that I think are going to apply artificial intelligence to, uh, you know, to the medical system in ways that are absolutely uh, game changing for for human lives, and uh, and so I'm excited about that. You know, it's it's um, I, I think this is a moment for uh, for a certain amount of optimism. You know, you can be I think you can be uh, a little. There's a I certainly have uh, the, you know a tendency to be a little Cassandra ish, a little a little a little. Um, you know, worried about all the bad things that are going to happen, and they're real. I don't. I don't think we shouldn't take them seriously, but I do. I do think we have to balance it with um, a healthy degree of optimism. I mean, there is there is there are real benefits to this technology, and I think we will see some of them um, sooner rather than later. I think they'll be they'll be quite meaningful. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Audio Socket Podcast. Stay tuned for more episodes and more guest speakers.